we often talk about black swan events, but I don't think anyone looks at it as a complete shutdown of the industry globally. So there might be an event that might be regional, it might be, you know, even a domestic issue. It certainly wouldn't drag out for six months. I think people would be lying if they said, we predicted this. And you only have to go back a short period of time to see what all of the forward-looking statements were being made about being back to full capacity by August or September. We're nowhere near it. When I think about the leaders who've had the sharpest or most devastating curveballs thrown at them, I can't think of anyone who's had more to contend with than Paul Scurra. In February, as the world was just coming to grips with this mysterious virus called COVID-19, Paul was watching his company, Virgin Australia, go into free fall. International flights were grounded and Virgin decided to double down on their domestic offer, only to watch that slip from their grip days later. I'm Kelly Reardon, and Curveball's the podcast that gives you a ringside seat into how leaders react to enormous challenges. And I figure there's no one better place to tell me about the highs and the lows than Virgin Australia CEO Paul Scurra. But spoiler alert, this is especially true now because, well, he's no longer the CEO. Talk about another curveball. I'm going to take you inside the company at their time of turmoil and you'll find out what's happened to Paul Scurra since. Paul Scurra started the year as the CEO of Virgin Australia. By February... He was dealing with an aviation shutdown on an unprecedented scale. By April, the company was in the hands of administrators. And not long after that, Paul was working through a process that would see US firm Bain Capital buy Virgin Australia. It got me to thinking, how do leaders confront those things they just didn't see coming? Those things that come out of nowhere. So I sat down with Paul Scurra, to try to tease this out, and I learned a lot, like how to keep your staff motivated when they're facing job cuts, and exactly how a buyout process works. But just as I was putting the final touches on this episode, something took me completely by surprise. You know, one thing I've always learned in all of the jobs I've had is that the owners have the right to make these decisions. Um, we mutually came to the uh, agreement that I would leave and Jane is the right person to take on and deliver their plan and to deliver to the expectations they have as an investment. And quite often you see private equity will go to people they know uh, and people who they feel is a, a safe set of hands and aligned to their outcomes and, and that is the reason why they have appointed Jane. That's right. Paul Scar is no longer the CEO of Virgin Australia – And that also threw me because, well, I just finalised this episode. So don't freak out, but looks like Paul Scurra is gone as head of Virgin. Oh, my God. There's too many things that have gone wrong now. But once I stopped freaking out about the launch of this very podcast, I realised that this interview, recorded before he decided to leave Virgin Australia, is a masterclass in leadership. It's not often you're allowed to peek inside a company at a time when things aren't going so well. Paul was candid about what he was dealing with, and this conversation is chock full of twists and turns. But don't worry, we're also bringing you up to date with his latest curveball. In your podcast feed right now is a bonus episode we recorded with Paul Scurra after he left the company. Whose decision was it for him to go? And what are his reflections on this unusual year? It's all there in the bonus episode. But now, the first instalment of this saga with Paul Scurra. Hi, Kelly. Thank you for having me. Now, Virgin Australia had to go into voluntary administration in April, and we are going to come to that later. But this isn't your first role in aviation and not the first time you've been involved in in a collapse either. Can you tell me a little bit about your time at ANSET? I'd be happy to tell you about that. I just hope that I'm not the common denominator here, (laughs) Kelly. Uh, But I wanted to be in aviation from the minute that uh, I, I turned 20. I don't know how why that happened other than to say 
I had a very poor upbringing and travel wasn't a thing we were able to do, particularly not in a plane. And I heard that if you worked in the airlines, you got to travel for free. And so I started my career in airlines in the early 90s and that culminated with a senior position at ANSET. And I joined them in 1999 as a part of a turnaround and Rod Eddington was the CEO. And he used a mantra which I've unashamedly stolen from him uh, about turning a great airline into a great business because ANSET wasn't a great business. Clearly, history tells it wasn't. Uh, But I was there right until the very end and uh, it was really surreal because on September 11, New York happened and on September the 14th, our airline collapsed. So you can imagine the the sombre nature and the environment that we were in at the time. And uh, there were many lessons out of that, that fortuitously, although no one signed up for this and no one ever saw it coming, we do talk about black swan events, which uh, are this very sort of event. Uh, But because of that, uh, I was well equipped to, I think, get us through the administration. What did you learn at ANSET about that collapse specifically around your leadership style that you've taken forward with you? I think from a, a lessons point of view, the, the best leader I ever learned from was when I actually worked at Qantas with James Strong. And uh, so I was able to model myself as a leader as I came through the ranks on him. And one of the things I tried to do at ANSET, although I certainly was not the CEO there at the time, but I was a general manager, was try and keep people informed as much as I could. Remembering it was only 20, well, not quite 20 years ago that ANSET collapsed, but communications were incredibly different. We didn't have email widespread like we do today. We certainly didn't have um, the social media that we have. And at times I remember people working for me had to race to their letterbox every day to see if there was any news. And, uh, And then they would be disappointed and flat knowing that at the very earliest, tomorrow might be the time they hear something. And so getting communication out and keeping them updated and informed was a really difficult thing to do compared to today. But I always remember uh, the feedback and the need for people to be kept informed uh, through the process. I also think going into administration early, although some external critics don't believe we did, but I certainly do, going into it early to give ourselves a fighting chance to come out uh, was a very important lesson. And, and we all know ANSET didn't come out of it, And uh, as we'll talk about a bit later, we are coming out of it. So there were some very important lessons there. I want to go back to late January. I mean, you probably had an inkling before many people of how bad COVID-19 would be because you had two passengers on a Tiger Airlines flight from Melbourne to the Gold Coast who tested positive. Can you take us inside Virgin in late January? What were the conversations going on in the company? We were concerned about what might happen with the virus because like everyone else in the world, we were watching the news and we had started to see cases grow in Australia and there was some concern about whether or not uh, airlines would play a role in the transmission. Uh, As it turns out, uh, getting it on a plane is incredibly unlikely. Uh, The issue with flying though is about people taking it from one city to another. And that's been the reason why the aviation sector has been shut down. But back in January in our company, even though we saw this coming, we thought we would just have to take similar measures to what happened back in SARS, which didn't see a wholesale shutdown of the airline industry. We might have seen uh, compulsory PPE implemented, but nobody envisaged at that point, no one in our industry, not just us, thought that there'd be a complete shutdown. But we were front and centre. We were learning as we went along about the virus. You know, we, we are well rehearsed for crisis. Uh, all airlines are really well rehearsed for crisis. And that did serve us well over the period that came after this. But we didn't know a lot about the virus. Uh, we were scrambling to find out uh, how contagious it was, you know, whether there was a risk to the passengers around us. So I remember when we carried those people from Melbourne to the Gold Coast, We weren't good at contact tracing at that point. We had to work with Queensland Health to get better at that. We had to identify all of the passengers sitting in the immediate zone and all of the crew as well and had to get them all tested. But that was sort of a real wake-up call about what might come as well. I mean, that black swan planning really intrigues me because not too many industries do rehearse for these sorts of events. But I mean complete shutdown. Is that on the scenario map at all? Well, not really, no. Um, And you know, we we often talk about black swan events, but I don't think, you know, certainly not us, I'm, I'm not sure other airlines would do it either, but I don't think anyone looks at it as a, a, you know, complete shutdown of the industry globally. 
you know, so there might be an event that might be regional, it might be, you know, even a domestic issue, um, it certainly wouldn't drag out for six months. Luckily for us, the rehearsal for all the other types of crisis that we rehearse for put us in good stead to manage through this. We just did it a lot more frequently, but we handled it really, really well in the way that we did it. But no, I don't think, uh, I, I think people would be lying if they said we predicted this. And you only have to go back a short period of time to see what all of the forward-looking statements were being made about being back to full capacity by August or September. We're nowhere near it. So from February, you and the board must have been bracing yourself for the worst. Can you tell me about that moment when you, as a leader, thought, we're done for here? Yeah, it's been um, pretty publicly reported uh, that it was the time uh, Jacinta Ardern stood up and said that they're going to close the New Zealand borders. At that point, we were we were fairly prominent in the New Zealand market. We certainly weren't the leading player there, but it, it was a big part of our network. And at that point, we were taking comfort in the fact that we were more domestic and more short-haul international than anything else. And we were hoping that we would be somewhat insulated from the impacts that international airlines were, were feeling. But when that happened, uh, when Jacinta closed the New Zealand border to Australia, uh, it, I think it upped the level of concern around the virus, particularly in this region. And it was only days later that our Prime Minister made a recommendation for domestic travel only to occur if it was absolutely essential. And in between those two dates, between the New Zealand Prime Minister and the Australian Prime Minister, uh, you could just see all of the risk management work going on inside big corporates who were saying, well, we need to take a cautious approach here. And they had pretty much already recommended that business travel should be stopped whilst there was so much uncertainty with the virus. So I think that was the aha moment. We tried many things after that to avoid going into administration. And we tried absolutely everything we possibly could. We talked to our existing shareholders. It's lost on a lot of people that they, even if they wanted to, they couldn't support us because they themselves were airlines and they didn't have any spare cash sitting around. And if they were subsidised by their governments, their governments insisted that that money gets spent in that country. So it was almost impossible for them to help us. We asked the government to help us um, and we, there was a whole series of measures we took before we went into administration. But I think the aha moment was the day the New Zealand Prime Minister stood up and closed the New Zealand borders. Your counterpart at Qantas, Alan Joyce, was quite public in saying that Virgin Australia shouldn't have any special treatment, there should just be an industry package, but there shouldn't be anything special in terms of rescuing Virgin Australia. Truthfully, did you ring him up and say, come on, mate, we need a bit of help here? Like, How do you respond to that? Alan and I have a good relationship. Uh, I have a, the utmost respect for him. He has done an amazing job at Qantas. And uh, I think some of that good work is only becoming evident right now because of how strong they are going through such a crisis. But I did take a different tack to Alan, clearly. You know, we are fierce competitors out in the commercial world. And I had been an advocate for, yes, we are asking for support, but we're not asking for it exclusively. We do believe the whole sector is going to need it. And as it turns out, the whole sector did need it. And uh, there has been um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars given to all airlines in the country. Um, my position on it, my personal position was that, you know, in an unprecedented crisis, the whole industry needs to come together. Uh, and I did use an analogy that it would be like two AFL teams turning up to play a game and the ground's destroyed and so they get together and fix the ground and then they go out and beat each other up again. Uh, <laughs> so that's the sort of atmosphere I thought we were in. And, uh, you know, you could, I take my hat off to Alan. His competitive spirit is uh, omnipresent and, uh, <laughs> and you know, he's, he runs his company the way he wants to and I do what I, I need to do here. So by late March, you and the board would have known it's dire straits. What's your leadership demeanour at that time, Paul, once you realised the sheer extent of this devastating event and the impact it would have on your workforce? What's your public appearance like inside the company and beyond? First and foremost, I think it's important to look like you are calm and in control at least of the message. You know, we all knew then that there were things that were outside of our control. Um, what we could control is how we react to it, how we, uh, how emotional or otherwise we get to it. Uh, but at that point in time, it's not lost on me that there's 10,500 people who uh, hang on every word I say. 
looking to me to lead through whatever it takes to rescue us. So the discussions with government or new owners or uh, existing owners. Uh, so I think it's important to keep everyone as calm as you possibly can. But at the same time, you need to keep them as informed as you possibly can as well. And it's not a time for uh, being cute with your words or being um, a little bit uh, less than transparent. It's very important to be all of those. Now, the trick with that is we did lead through, me and my team, in a very calm way. Um, we did control the way the message was was put out. But we were at that point, and we still technically are, ASX listed. So, so that's a tricky balance then, right? Very, yeah. So you've got to be, you know, there's a lot of legal parameters around what you can say about forward-looking statements. So as much as we wanted to look calm and in control and we wanted to be as transparent and honest as we possibly could, we still had to run the ruler over it from an ASX perspective and make sure we didn't breach any any guidelines or laws. So that's a tricky balancing act. But I think the approach that we took was one about not sugarcoating the multiple possibilities that could come. So we were setting up the workforce to say, look, you know, you need to get yourself ready for these possible outcomes because if this keeps going the way it's going, there is an inevitability about it. And we'll do what we can to make sure you're informed, you're given as much notice as you can, and that we treat you really well through that process. The thing I find extraordinary about this is there's being transparent and then there's just the sheer volume of information that you're dealing with and the fast-paced nature of which it's coming. So mm. to tell staff and keep them informed about what's going on requires you to be on top of things in a very fast-moving environment. And, and many leaders, when they don't know what the answers are, would duck for cover. You took a different tack. Do you think that's worked? Has that held you in good stead? Mostly it has. I think the downside to it is if you haven't got all the answers, it does risk a little bit of criticism coming back towards you. But we took the approach, I took the approach that even if I've got nothing really to say, I need to go and say I've got nothing to say. And one of the biggest and best decisions we made was implementing the Workplace by Facebook platform. We had previously used Yammer. Um, it wasn't that effective. Uh, this tool was a godsend, frankly, in that, and we were planning to put it in anyway, but we fast-tracked it by three weeks to make sure that we could use it for the crisis. But it allows us to communicate widely to pretty much every employee at an instant's notice. So if there's a headline I see on the TV that's out of context or needs explanation, I can jump onto Facebook or workplace and, uh, and give people context. Uh, I can address them live uh, at, and I can do it with five minutes notice and they can ask me questions live from all over the country. So remembering that we had over 8,000 people stood down, what kept us all connected was this tool, this platform, and it allowed me to communicate with them really f frequently as things change. So we were able to do three and four times a day at the height of it all, tell them a story as it evolved. And uh, that really helped a lot. Which is a far cry from your checking your mailbox every 24 hours at ANZAC, right? So you, you, I can absolutely see the link here between the information that you weren't getting at ANZAC and your dedication to keeping people informed. Yep. I've spoken to quite a few employees at Virgin in the last few weeks. They are, I've, I've got to tell you, they are very, very positive about you. And in a way that I haven't seen with many other CEOs, you know, mm. you'll find some who like them and some who grumble and whatever. People were sending food packages to your house. People were worried about you personally. People felt that you've been um, caring. You walk the floor. I mean, that must be quite humbling in a way. It's incredibly humbling. One of the words that I use here more than anywhere is love. I love the people at work for Virgin Australia. Before I actually took over as CEO, I was a seven-year customer. Before that, I was with the competition. And I just really had uh, such respect for the way that they went about their job, the vibrancy and professionalism, uh, but how much they really cared, the massive care factor in, in what they do. So it was a privilege to take over when I did and a privilege to take over a group of people that I'd long admired. And so I think... Uh, showing respect is all about making sure that there's vulnerability and humility in the way that you lead and care, but also making sure that 
to the point I was making before, you you treat them like adults and you actually keep them informed. And I think that's been the reason that some of that really humbling feedback is coming in. Every time I fly, I sit in the cockpit for a period. I then talk to the crew at the front and then the crew at the back. It's a really good way to get a handle on how well or otherwise we're doing culturally, uh, how the leaders are doing and how the customers are feeling about us. So I think that exposes me to the the front line a bit more than other CEOs. There's plenty that do it, uh, but it's it's lovely feedback. And it, yeah, I was getting um, really nice packages sent to me and, <laughs> uh, you know, had quite a few anonymous bunches of flowers or people would bake cookies and send them to me. Uh, and my, even the coffee shop I go to every morning, I went over there one day and someone had bought me, you know, a month's worth of coffees anonymously just to say thank you. But it is really important to have a great team around me, which is exactly what enables me to have the time to do that. You haven't been at Virgin for all that long. I think you came into the CEO role in early 2019, so not even in the job 12 months. Mm. So how were you able to get the company to a point and your leadership team to a point where you could navigate this crisis successfully and have the sort of um, the admiration or the trust in you that you've already... I mean, that normally takes a few years to build. I think it all comes down to the work that we'd done from when I took over to going into the crisis, the work that we'd done around what is it we stand for, what differentiates us and what values are we going to demonstrate and live by every single day and why do we exist? What's the purpose of turning up to work every day? Um, and all of that combined gives a you know, the, the destination on the top of the hill that we're all linking arms and heading towards and unity and solidarity and having a cause or a purpose is very important for a company. And I think that we were making really good progress on that. And in the early days, we made a decision, you know, there's a couple of things we wanted to do about deepening and enhancing the attitude that's at the front line and creating a high trust culture. So I think there was a little bit of a loss of, of trust between management and the front line, and we wanted to rebuild that trust. So one of the best ways to do that and to build the values, to build the the purpose and the direction of the company is to ask your staff what is and isn't working. So in that survey that we did, we called it our mojo. So uh, we, you know, we were checking on our mojo. Yeah. And um, which is a really... It's always good to have a quip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How, how's our mojo? Have we lost it? Are we getting it back? And so that was really good. And uh, our mojo survey told us that, look, Paul, you talk about a high trust environment. Here's things that make us feel not trusted. So it was a pretty good to-do list just to tick off and go, well, there's no reason to continue with that policy for policy's sake. Let's prove we're serious about this high trust culture. And one example was when people, they do get the privilege of staff travel. They get the privilege of being able to fly for next to nothing. It's not quite nothing. But when they do, we say, this is a privilege, so you need to dress up, right? So because there's a risk that one or two people might turn up and bought shorts, thongs and a singlet. So we would treat all of the people doing the right thing as if they were possibly going to do the wrong thing and it was a low trust environment. So we said, hey, we trust you. We trust you know how to dress appropriately to fly on our airline and uh, w if one or two people turn up in board shorts and thongs, we'll deal with them but we're not going to take your comfort away for that reason and that was a flip of trust and we did a number of those things early days which proved that we were listening and proved that we did trust our people. It does seem that your predecessor, John Borghetti, who'd, who'd once been one of the top dogs at Qantas and I think was in line for the job against Alan Joyce, um, was trying to take Virgin up market. He was sort of going after the Qantas business and you wanted to do something else with the airline. Can you take me inside your thought process around that? I think John created a great airline uh, and one I loved uh, as a customer. And uh, I think, and hindsight's a very, very easy way to judge the past. So I'm not going to do that with John. You know, I think he, he created a, a really strong competitor to, to Qantas. Uh, so what I wanted to do was I didn't really want to change the product too much, but I wanted to simplify the business and lower the cost base so it became profitable. So what our customers are loyal to us for is the product and the service. So we need to try and preserve that as much as we can. We will have to make some product changes, but make sure that we simplify the business and take away some of the areas where the cost had crept above what was uh, what was sustainable. And uh, so that would have meant and does mean now some hard decisions around where we do and don't fly. 
we can't be all things to all people. We need to take the shareholders' wishes into into account and make sure we deliver for them as much as for the customers and our people. I often say that the job of a CEO is to sit in the centre of three very important groups of people, your, your people first and foremost, your customers because they pay your bills ultimately, and your shareholders because they're the ones that have invested the money in. So I can't keep them all happy all of the time. So a CEO's job, the balance is to keep most of them happy most of the time <laughs> uh, because you're going to have to say no to one of them in order to keep the balance for a good outcome for the other stakeholders. Now that Bain Capital have come in, what will that mean for the continuation of of jobs for Virgin Australia staff, but also in reining in costs? I'm in admiration of Bain uh, for having the courage to come and save an airline in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so I don't think that courage will be acknowledged really until we're out of it and people see the product that we we have and that there's still a very competitive aviation sector here in Australia. Uh, So what it means for us is that they, it means that all 10,500 people who worked previously uh, didn't lose their jobs. It's a bittersweet feeling though, because at the moment with the way we're going, it looks like about 6,000 will. That's the sweet part. The bitter part is having to tell over this period of time, four and a half thousand people that they don't have a job and none of it is their fault. So they've done and served us beautifully and then we've had to turn around and do this. Um, but we're not the only airline in the world having to do that. Every one of them is at the moment. So so definitely uh, creating a future for more than half of our employees is a positive. Uh, and from a cost perspective, because they bought us out of administration, administration allows us to go through a process that you otherwise wouldn't be able to go through, and that is to reset all of your contracts at more market-facing costs. And it's not a real seller's market at the moment in the airline industry, so we can lock in some really competitive rates. Uh, the pain side of that is watching people who had financially backed us beforehand hurt as well. So we didn't despite some commentary you'll get out there, we didn't trade our way into administration. We weren't as healthy as we needed to be, but if you use a health analogy, we weren't on our way to hospital and we certainly weren't on our way to intensive care, but we'd probably have to go on The Biggest Loser, right? (laughs) So that's where we were. Uh, But because of COVID, we lost access to most of $6 billion worth of revenue overnight. It is the most fluid and constant source of capital and we lost it. And it was probably the equivalent of someone having a pretty big mortgage and then losing their job. So when you've got the job, you're okay. When you lose your job, your mortgage is out of the money and you're in trouble. And that's what happened to us. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, a challenging period to go through from that perspective. Did you sleep? Like, well, honestly, what, what was life like in March for you? And are you the one who's dealing with Bain Capital? Like, is, uh, are you brokering that? How does that work? Partially. It was a team effort, actually. Uh, so when we agreed with the board that we would go into administration, we appointed Deloitte to do that. Um, that turned out to be a really, really good decision. Uh, we said to Deloitte, we want to give ourselves the best chance to come out. We want to come out quickly. And administrations aren't always seen as quick and uh, positive. Uh, there are some good stories and there's some bad stories. We didn't want it to be dragged out because we didn't want to lose our segment of the market. So we appointed Deloitte to do that. And I worked hand in hand with Deloitte to then go into selling mode, which is, first of all, we had to tidy up the cost base, which is the operational imperative. And we did that as best we can. Then we had to do um, basically a sales pitch to, I think we did that to 10 or more different interested parties and there was follow-ups and there was, you know, back-to-back meetings with different uh, interested parties. Uh, Did I sleep? I didn't sleep a lot, actually, uh, but there was a lot of adrenaline as well. Um, That responsibility of knowing that people's futures are in my hands was one that really weighed heavily on me. So uh, the combination of that stress plus the adrenaline with going through this process meant that I didn't sleep much at all. I'm slowly getting back into a sleeping pattern. (laughs) It, It takes a lot of grit, though, to be able to, and resilience, you know, to use a almost an overused phrase now, to be able to weather that sort of negotiation, cost cutting, dealing with the staff. What would you say the personal cost has been for you? Uh, probably health and fitness. Uh, so I am normally someone that advocates strongly for work-life balance. Uh, go as hard as you can during the day at work, 
be productive, but make sure you give yourself time to exercise and eat right and sleep right. And the last three I haven't been doing very well at all. <laughs> We're trying to force it into the diary. Um, but the other thing that really helped me through this process is through the process of, of reinventing the airline when I took over in March 2019, we restructured it into a far simpler structure with much clearer accountabilities and we recruited all the right people to actually take over the main functions. And having them uh, was a God's hidden to me because they've just been brilliant through this process. So uh, we've worked beautifully together as a team. People have rolled their sleeves up. There hasn't been a single complaint, even though they're all in the same boat as me, seven day a week, you know, late night calls, early morning calls. Uh, they've been brilliant. So I can't take the credit. They've been the real strength behind me. This is Curveball, and my guest is CEO of Virgin Australia, Paul Scurra. Of course, this isn't the only role that you've had, even in the airline industry. It seems to me like um, there's a bit of a transport theme to your career. You were at Queensland Rail for a while. I was. Yeah, I never thought I'd end up running a railway, but I, I did. Uh, I know I, I think this is part of the rehearsal or the experience that helped here is that um, coincided with the floods, the Queensland floods. So I was running Queensland Rail when we went through that and we had 8,000 kilometres of track around the state and at one point during the floods, 4,000 kilometres was underwater. And so that is a, a disaster that happened everywhere. You know, in Queensland Rail, it's not unusual during monsoon season or cyclone season to have weather events at different parts around the network. But what was so unusual that year was it all happened everywhere at once. The whole state was, yeah. Yeah, so that allowed us to, again, we practiced crises well at, at the railway as well. and uh, But that really tested out, you know, what was the focus of us as leaders. And we had, as well as having to deal with all of the customers that needed to be dealt with, which were incredibly important, uh, we had uh, 75 people lose everything, 75 of our own people lose everything. So we prioritised them and we got the tradesmen in our business to go and help reconnect water and power and we empowered their leaders to go and buy them a new fridge and a new kettle, those little things as well. Um, at the same time as that happened, uh, at least half the QR um, suburban fleet was to be parked at the main train yard, which was predicted to go underwater. And so we had to move all of the trains and we did them nose to tail on different reaches of the network that were above the flood line. So I guess, that, does that mean you're parking them up hills? What does that mean? Yeah, it meant we were parking it on higher points of the network, but uh, the enduring memory, the, one of the really sad things about that uh, was that Twitter started going crazy about this opportunity to graffiti a whole line of trains. So we had kilometres of trains nose to tail and then they all got completely covered in graffiti and it cost $5 million to remove that. Wow. Um, eventually we caught the perpetrators because normally graffiti people are a little bit, um, they care about it but maybe not enough to do anything about it. Uh, but they were so angry that this happened during such a crisis for the city that people were videoing them and following them home. And so it was probably the most arrests of graffiti vandals ever. But uh, uh, that, that whole event going through the floods at uh, Queensland Rail really showed me that through it, you cannot forget your people. And it's an opportunity to prove who is your highest priority uh, or what is, and it turned out to be our people. The other thing that happened during the Queensland floods is that the Premier at the time, Anna Bly, was in a way outshining the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, in the way she was communicating. Were you watching that, getting any lessons? I think your wife, Nicole, has worked for Anna Bly. Yeah, I, I don't know how well it is known, but Anna the night before she did her Queenslander speech, couldn't make it home from the uh, emergency management centre because of where the river flooding was occurring. So she stayed at our house and uh, she wrote her Queenslander speech in our spare bedroom. <laughs> so uh, I always admired Anna as a premier. And I think what we saw through that process is because it was real-time breaking news, she was unedited. So people saw the Anna I always saw 
and she was genuine and caring and all of those things that I knew she was, but they got to see it unedited for the first time in a long time. Uh, but what I really loved about it was just the continue updates, the sharing of information, making sure people were well well informed. And I think it was the first time in the world where a sign language um, expert was there as well. And that is now the gold standard for emergency mm. management. So uh, I think Anna, Anna should and does get a lot of credit for that. Uh, but I, I really took away from that the compassion, the caring and the regular update. And prior to that, it was DP World Australia, who I think are stevedores. So again... Transport. What's going on here? Well, <laughs> there's some higher power pushing me in this direction because I started out at an airline. I moved out of the airline industry into travel retailing and then I ended up at a railway. So uh, I didn't ever think that was going to happen. And then I went into a freight railway, which I really knew nothing about. It was more a leadership and commercial role. I got to know a lot about it. And then I ended up running a stevedore. Now, the irony there is my father was a merchant seaman, but he finished... Um, the last 18 years of his life was working for the company I ended up running. So he would be turning in his grave to know that I was one of those management uh, <laughs> that he was so militant towards. But uh, it was it actually allowed me to break down the barriers a lot. And it was almost like, I didn't plan it that way, but it was almost like it was always, almost meant to be that I was in that position. So I never thought that I'd work my way back to aviation. I thought I was getting further away from it. So when the Virgin role came up, I was absolutely thrilled. But you're right, it's... The, a lot of people, if they stay in the one industry and you go and join them at that company and you start talking about the way things happen, they'll say, oh, yes, but we're different. And the thing they don't realise, and I've had real hand experience here, is how similar it all is. And, uh, you know, there was a saying at Queensland Rail, Paul, you have to understand there's the right way, the wrong way or the railway. <laughs> And uh, so there's a little bit of that thinking in all of these, but I brought the commonality of those roles together and I was able to use best practice from one industry to take it into another and it worked really well. You mentioned at the beginning of the interview, you know, you, you came up from a, a fairly poor family. There weren't these luxurious holidays. How did you develop as a leader and, and were you academic at school? How did you end up sort of in a CEO role? It's a really good question. I think... Was I academic? Not really. Uh, I think I had a lot of potential, but I was so focused on sport. That was my obsession. I didn't reach my potential at high school. What uh, sport? Uh, Australian rules football. Okay, yeah. so that means you, you can't still get back into it probably. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, skiing's my passion now, but um, yeah, I was big into AFL. I played cricket, I played basketball, but whatever it was, I was obsessed with it. So all winter I'd play footy. All summer I played cricket and basketball, um, and that's all I really cared about. But I was uh, I was o okay enough to get onto an AFL, or then it was called VFL list, and I was obsessed with playing VFL football. But then I got pretty badly injured, and what I'd learned through that process, first of all, you learn, uh, you know, my parents were were caring, loving uh, parents. Mum's still alive, and she worked hard, and I've got lots to be grateful for. Uh, but they weren't able to fund me um, once I got to a certain age. So you know you're on your own. And I think that's actually a powerful life lesson that you're on your own. They divorced when I was about 14. So it was just me and my dad. Um, my dad wasn't that healthy for various reasons. And uh, so that was a, I had to grow up a lot quicker. So when you learn you're on your own, um, I, I sort of knew I didn't want that life. Uh, and I was motivated to get away from that life. At that point, I didn't really know what I was being motivated towards, though. So I knew I didn't want that. I wasn't really clear about what I did want. And when travel came along, that gave me a bit of a spark to reach for something. Uh, at the same time, I through football, I learned goal setting, role playing, uh, making sure that you are disciplined, and a lot of things that I now realise were incredibly valuable life lessons. And I just learned how to goal set, how to believe, uh, and I really got... Um, without getting too spiritual, I really got deep into understanding that the mind is an incredibly powerful thing. And when I first got a job at Australian Airlines, I was in the reservation centre and I got promoted to a, a national job and then there was another job in Brisbane. I was living in Melbourne as the reservations manager. And I thought that'd be great. I was young, ambitious, maybe too cocky too, by the way. <laughs> and in the interview, uh, a guy who was two levels above me said, where do you see yourself going in the airline? 
And because I'd been working on my mind and belief, I said, well, there's no reason why I can't be the CEO here one day. Really? And he... You said those words aloud. I did, absolutely. Wow. And he said, you're kidding. And then I didn't get the job. And then in the aftermath, he berated me for being so cocky and even daring to believe that I could be the CEO. Mm. And so, but he was right. I never ended up the CEO of Qantas. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I made it here yeah, to Virgin. I hope so. he once some came to try and give you a job or something and you were able to, uh, you know, berate him back or something. Mm. It's interesting though, that sense of what you learn early on and the way that drives you. Mm. You have children of your own now. What do you hope for them, particularly now we're in this weird environment where we, we're in a recession, jobs are going to be hard to come by. What are you hoping will be the future for them? I think there's something about my parenting that didn't want them to go through what I went through. I would not change a thing about my life. And I think added up the grand sum of all of that has created the life that I've got. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. But there is part of it that you say, I'd rather they didn't go through it. Uh, and there's a part of me now that thinks that probably wasn't the best thing for them because uh, there are valuable life lessons in all of that. But they're, they're both beautiful girls grown up. Um, you know, my older daughter lives in Vancouver. She's got her own business. She's doing really well. She's got a beautiful disposition on life. And she lives each day as it comes day to day. And I admire that about her. Uh, the younger one uh, has been doing acting in Hollywood uh, acting academy in Hollywood. And so we just got her home here about three days before we shut down the borders. So she's back here. And I, th I feel for her, she's 20. And her friends and cohort are really feeling the negativity in the environment right now. And I think it's incumbent upon leaders at all levels, you know, company leaders and political leaders, to not lose sight of the fact that hope is very important. And we, are, we do need leadership to get through the crisis, but we need hope as well. And I think we've lost that balance a little bit. And I'm seeing liberties that I took for granted not being there for them right now. Now, it will finish at some point, uh, but uh, you know we've got to be careful what our leaders say. So there was a chief health officer that said, the bad news is life as we know it's not coming back. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement but one I think we need to balance with more hope. Tell me about the fact that Virgin will have to inevitably let thousands of people go through this. Is there a way to do that well? As well as you can. Uh, I don't think anyone finds it a positive experience, either whether you're delivering it or whether you're receiving it. Of course, it's a little, a little less impactful if you're staying and you're asking someone to leave, and we have to be very sensitive to that. Um, I don't think there's, I think you can do it as well as you can, but it's never a positive experience. So for my team, we want to make sure that we are seen as respectful, open, transparent, um, and caring. And we give as much certainty as we can, as quickly as we can. Uncertainty is a real stressor. And so sometimes it is better, even though at the time, the emotional reaction might not suggest so, but it is better to give people certainty so they can move on one way or the other. Uh, so we will do it as well as we possibly can and I think in many ways better than others, but it's not a positive experience. And what will the future be for you, Paul Scurra? Will you remain in the CEO role? Yeah, absolutely. I, well, as long as Bain want me there and uh, I, I really feel like there's, there's unfinished business here, but there's a great opportunity as well. Uh, I want to be around leading this company when we come out of the crisis and we start going very well again. I was going to say start flying again, but um, flying in an economic sense. And I really want to be around to be there when we re-invite someone back to work for us who's been here before as we grow. And it's a promise we've made that when we grow, we'll go back to those we've asked to leave. So I want to be there to make good on that promise. Well, it wasn't to be. Paul Scurr is no longer the CEO of Virgin Australia, having been replaced by Jane Herdlicker, who's a former Qantas executive. And if you're wondering what Paul Scurr thinks of all that and how he's dealt with yet another curveball, we've recorded an update with him. Paul sat down with me to talk about what he's learned this year and what might be next for him. 
You can listen to that conversation right now. It's available as a bonus episode in your podcast feed already. Curveballs, a production of Deadset Studios. My thanks to the awesome women who've jumped in to help me make this show in record time. Rachel Fountain, Hannah Kinder, you guys totally saved me during my own curveball moment. And big love to Angie Grant for sound design. Thanks to Corey Layton and the team at ARN and iHeartRadio, and also to our mates at community radio station 4ZZZ in Brisbane. I'd love you to subscribe to this show. It's completely free, but subscribing means you're alerted each time a new episode comes out, like a beautiful little gift there right in your podcasting app. And you should tell your mates that you can listen to this show anywhere, like on the iHeartRadio app when you're on the bus, or via Spotify when you're on the treadmill at the gym, or via Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts right there on your phone when you're standing in the coffee queue. How good is that? And look... I don't mind shouting at the kids sometimes, but I also like shouting at my smart speaker. Hey, Google, play the Curveball podcast. I mean, how easy is that? Hey, Alexa, play me the Curveball podcast. But of course, if you're old school, just type Curveball podcast into a search engine and listen on your computer. Next on Curveball, a woman who loves to take risks even in the middle of a pandemic. A boat in the harbour is safe, but eventually the bottom will rot out. If you are not having any failures, you are not taking enough risks and you're not trying hard enough. I used to work on the checkout at Coles and here I am owning this business. I can't tell you the thrill that I see if I'm in a supermarket and someone's putting a Carmen's product in their trolley. Make sure you're subscribed to Curveball to hear from Carolyn Creswell of the Carmen's Food Empire.